Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Richard Smith. I work at Google. Um, I do quite a lot of different things there. I wear a number of different hats. So I'm on the C++ committee where I'm the project editor, which means I'm the person who puts together the, uh, the working drafts, sends the documents uh, have presence to be sent to ISO, uh, edits the whole thing together. Um, I've also been responsible for a number of the features that have gone into C++ 14 and 17. Um, and my laptop is uh, second. All right. Um, so I also uh, I am the uh, lead developer of the Clang compiler, which uh, hopefully at least a few of you have heard of. Um, and at Google, I'm also a professional language lawyer. Um, <laughs> in fact, I'm kind of a little bit known for telling people they have, uh, they have undefined behavior, and uh, my, my job title inside Google is mob language lawyer. Like, nice problem you've got there. It would be a shame if something were to happen to it. <laughs> okay, so... Today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about uh, modules, about modules in Clang, um, a little bit about the modules TS, and about some ideas that we've been discussing um, to help uh, us at Google and the rest of the community embrace the modules TS and transition to it. So um, if you're expecting a talk about uh, the Lord of the Rings, I'm sorry, this is not what, what this is going to be about, but there's other talks, there's doors at the back. Um, okay, so firstly, this is about an incremental C++ modules design. So what do I mean by incremental? So first of all, if you're not aware, Google has a C++ code base. It's pretty big. It may in fact be uh, one of or the largest uh, monolithic C++ code base in the world. Um, this means we have lots of code. We can't actually update the whole code base all at once in a single commit in a lot of cases. Um, we have a lot of changes going into our code base. Um, this means, uh, by, by a lot, I mean we have um, a change to our C++ code base every few seconds. So if you imagine if you're trying to, say, rename something, as something that's very widely used, um, you want to, uh, to first make the name available in two different places, uh, the old place and the new place, transition everything across, and then remove the old name. Well, in that time between doing the transition and removing the old name, there's a good chance that some new uses of it have arrived. It's a bit of a pain. And the other thing is, we have a lot of developers, uh, which means if we break the build temporarily, there's going to be a large number of frowny faces. And all of our, our libraries, or at least a large proportion of our libraries, have a lot of dependencies on other libraries. They have a lot of libraries depending on them. And some of those dependencies are things we actually can't or don't want to change for a variety of technical reasons. Uh, and in fact, the, these, uh, these problems are not unique to Google. Um, they're, they're common across uh, large parts of the industry. If you think about uh, someone who is vending a library to some, someone else, they have similar problems that they don't want to break other people. And so in order to uh, enable changes to be made in this configuration, we need an incremental development process, something which is not monolithic, something which is not, we change the entire world all in one step. So we can't require simultaneous changes across many components if we want to make a change. And in fact, this is the property that we want, that every change we make can be made as a sequence of local incremental changes. And the code base needs to compile and work, and the tests pass at every step along the way. That's the goal. There are some cases where we can't meet that goal. We usually just approximate this, but this is what we're trying to achieve. And that's what I mean by incremental. And uh, Titus uh, gave a great talk on sustainability at CPPCon last year. So if you want to know more about all of this stuff, uh, go watch that. And then, of course, this is a talk about modules. So what are modules? We just don't know. So this is my attempt at defining what we mean when we say modules. Lots of people mean lots of different things. Um, some people mean the ML style modules, which is not really what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is this. Modules are a way for one logical unit of code to take its interface and expose it to another logical unit of code. And in some sense, this is a large code base problem, but for that, you mean large uh, to be more than one file. So most people have code bases large enough to need something like this. And, and I'm sure some of you are thinking, we have a solution to this problem. So the traditional solution is we use hash includes. 
Uh, hash includes uh, mean we textually duplicate the interface of a module into each one of its users. Um, and as I'm sure we know, this has a number of problems. So one of them is that it's, it's really brittle. So if someone defines a macro and then includes your header, that can change the meaning of your header in a way you didn't intend. But it's not just macros. If someone declares a function and then includes your header, that can change the meaning of your header as well. Something we see if I'm out is someone defines an operator left shift for some uh, standard, uh, for some type to stream it, and then they include a header, and how that type is written to OStreams depends on whether or not some other uh, header was included first. Another problem with hash includes is they're kind of uncontrolled. So if I'm exposing the interface of my library to someone, and I need in order to implement that interface, or in, in order to implement some of the parts of that interface that I'm putting in my header, some parts of my class definition, I need something else. Um, I can't stop that other header that I include being leaked to the people who include me. Um, you, you just can't import something for your own private use in a header, and that means that people will develop dependencies on you to provide something that you didn't want to provide, and if you remove that, you break them. And of course, the big problem, um, the one that initially led uh, Google to invest heavily in modules, um, but not, definitely not the only problem, is that hash includes is slow. It's, it's slow just to get the pieces that you want because all the pieces that you want are parsed every time for everyone who includes it, and most of the stuff you get is actually things you didn't even want. That's not the interface you're asking for. So um, this is uh, somewhat similar to a graph from Manuel's talk, if you saw that. Uh, we have order n source files, order m headers included in each, and what we find in practice is that unless we're careful, m grows pretty much linearly with n. So the entire problem ends up being quadratic, which is kind of appalling. And even for really small files, we end up including just a huge number of header files. <laughs> so these 195 files, that's megabytes of source code for hello world. So I'm a compiler guy. It's my job to, uh, to ask the crazy questions. Uh, and as a language lawyer, it's kind of my job to answer them. So the question is, is there something we can do about this with C++ as it is to fix the problem? Is it just that the compiler is doing a bad job? So I'm going to make a really audacious claim. My claim is that C++ has a module system already. Now, you probably don't believe me. And I'm not talking about hash includes. Um, I'm talking about something which is actually a little bit more principled and solves some of the problems that we were just mentioning. So in order for a C++ module system to be useful and to be correct from a language lawyer perspective, it must conform to the standard and it must still do what people meant when they wrote their source code. So I'm going to start by talking about C++'s one definition rule. Um, I assume most people here have heard of the one definition rule. Does anyone think they can tell me what it is? <laughs> no hands. OK. So. I'm gonna, just going to give you a brief rundown of what the one definition rule is, because it, it does matter. Um, so there must be at least one definition of each entity that is used by a program. And this is C++, so when we say used, we don't actually mean its name appeared. We mean something more complex, which is to do with whether you use it just for its value or whether you also use its address. This is uh, why you sometimes don't need to define static data members. But mostly it means if you use its name in an evaluated context, then it's used and there must be a definition. But that can't be it, right? This is C++. There's not one one definition rule. Here's the second one definition rule. One definition rule number two. There must be at most one definition of various different types of entity. So you get at most one distinct definition uh, for, for anything. And by distinct, what I mean is the token sequence, every time you define the same thing, it's got to be exactly the same. And those tokens have got to be interpreted in the same way. Uh, so you can't get around this by saying, well, yeah, but I used the same token, but it, it look up, found something different here than over there. That's not OK. If you break this rule, um, just like if you break the first rule, your program's ill-formed, um, no, uh, no diagnostics required, your compiler might eat your program. Um, you get one def at most one definition per translation unit. If you already have a defin definition visible, you're not allowed to give another one. I think we, uh, we pretty much all are familiar with that part. 
And for things which are, have strong linkage, things like non-inline variables, non-inline functions, you get at most one definition per program. And like I said, this is C++, so there's not two one definition rules, there's three. <laughs> so one definition rule number three says, this is the good bit, this is the exciting bit. If you follow these first two rules, the program behaves as if there is exactly one definition. So if you have the same class textually duplicated into two uh, source files because you used a hash include or maybe because, just because you copied and pasted it or you had a monkey at the keyboard who got lucky, then the program behaves as if there is exactly one definition in total. Those two translation units are required to act as if they are both talking about the same class, the same inline function. Uh, if that inline function, say, has a static uh, local variable, that is the same static local variable because there's only one function in total. The implementation is required to make this happen somehow. But the good news is, this actually means we only need to parse each definition of each entity in the entire program once. Once per definition, not once per time it's textually included. So this gives us an inkling of how we might do modules in standard C++. And the next thing is we're gonna make an observation, which is that most headers are what I'm going to call modular. And what I mean by this is that this is a normal header file. It's not doing weird tricks like being an X macro, doing different things depending on what you defined before you included it. It's not a cert.h. Um, it's self-contained, which means it includes everything that it uses. Its interface is not in intended to depend on other things being provided first before it's included, and it's not intended to have any other effect on the program other than making certain things visible. Now, Suppose we know in advance what the modular headers are. We can compile each modular header as a separate translation unit. And the, sec uh, the next trick we're gonna use is this. Hash include doesn't have to mean find a file using include search paths, pull it in off the disk, tokenize it, and plunk those tokens into the file. It's actually a little bit more general than that. It's implementation to find how those tokens are produced. So we can pretend. We can pretend that uh, we take a token stream formed by compiling that modular header and suck that into the file at the point where we see the hash include instead of going back to, to disk and retokenizing the original file. Um, and we can do that in a context which prevents macros from being injected. We, we just use our imagination to, to say there is some token stream which behaves that way. That's enough. And then we make an observation. If your header was modular, if you actually wrote a normal sane header then this does the same thing that your program already did. It's pretty cool. It's kind of of academic interest, perhaps, you might argue, but it does the same thing your program already did. Or if it does something different, it's because you've avoided a bug that you used to have where some uh, macro or some declaration that came beforehand was changing the meaning in a way you didn't intend. Okay, now because we have this control over what the, is in this, uh, this header that we inject, we can actually implement that a different way. And the way we implement it is when we do this first step of uh, compiling the header, we can cache what those uh, declarations, definitions, macros, whatever else were, and instead of doing any recompilation tool, just make them visible. Okay, and because we have the ODR, we don't need to care that they might actually have meant something slightly different in different contexts, and we've been told that was not the intent of the program. So just a, a quick rundown of how that works. I'll be a bit brief because Manuel has covered a little bit of, it, of this in, in his talk. So we parse foo.h, we compile it as if it were a source file. Uh, we generate a PCM file which contains a pre-compiled form of that source file. We're gonna call these AST files, but it's not actually an AST. Clang has a, a data structure called the AST, but it's not abstract. It's actually very concrete and says specific meanings. Um, it's not representing the syntax of the program, it represents the semantics and the syntax. And it's not a tree, it's actually a graph. But <laughs> it's an AST, okay? <laughs> so we write out this file, and then later we, uh, we see a hash include of this. Um, the compilation step for the CPP file is provided the PCM as input, and it just makes those things visible and then they can be used. And likewise, um, if we have another file, this one sees this hash include of, uh, of foo.h, makes that visible, sees an include of some header which we didn't say was modular, maybe it's doing some weird stuff, um, and does not make that one visible, it just textually includes it. 
and then defines a bar, we write out a bar PCM, and then obviously you can use multiple of these when compiling a C++ source file, which at this stage is one of the benefits we get over something um, like recompiled headers. Okay, so something weird just happened here. We have this textual inclusion of nonmodular.h in foo, and another textual inclusion of nonmodular.h in bar. So suppose that looks like this. When we compile bar.h, um, we've already got a, a blah function visible from the hash include of foo. So when we get to the hash include of nonmodular.h, um, we might have a problem. And the problem is this. If we don't export the macros, in particular the include guards, from foo.h, which maybe we don't want to do, maybe we have some feelings about macros. Um, if we don't <laughs> export the, the macros from foo.h and import them into bar.h, we're going to see a second definition of this blah function. And as I mentioned, you can only have, if you've already got a definition of something visible, you're not allowed another one. The ODR says no. So we must export the include guards from nonmodular.h when we build foo. And we actually have a very general principle from this, which is that for legacy headers, for non-modular headers, uh, the macros and the C++ level declarations are inseparable. You must make one visible whenever you make the other one visible. And if you don't, things will go wrong. And in deployment at Google, we have seen this time and again. Anytime we try to uh, deviate from this principle, we have been very badly burned. Okay, so we have something pretty cool now. Uh, we have a system which generates results which if your headers are modular when you say they are, we'll give you results which are essentially the same as you'd have got for any other regular C++ compilation. So you can share source files between a compiler that does this and one that doesn't. Um, and there are a few restrictions on, on when you can do that. Um, but actually, these restrictions are pretty much just us saying, like we promised, the header file is actually modular. And these were restrictions we really did want. We've been saved from certain sources of badness by these. Okay, so um, one thing that I've been working on at Google is getting this to work in Clang. So um, before I started working on Clang, Doug Gregor and various other people had uh, basic module support for C using similar principles working, but the C++ support was, was a bit weak, and in fact, there were quite a lot of bugs. Um, so I've spent a fair amount of time getting this working, and we now have essentially production ready, I mean, we're, we're using it um, in Google. Uh, production ready uh, implementation of this in Clang uh, has been for several releases. And we have a file called a module map, which Manuel talked a little bit about, which specifies, amongst other things, which of the headers are the modular headers. Okay, so does it work? Uh, actually, um, we've deployed this form of modules on a number of code bases, uh, not just Google's. So the Clang and LLVM code base, uh, they compile without modification other than bug fixes. I mean, assuming you consider non-modular headers to be a bug, which I, I think most people probably would. Uh, we're using underneath that uh, stock libc++, stock glibc. Uh, glibc completely unmodified, libc++ needed a few fixes. Um, and those have accompanying module maps just to say which the modular headers are and which are the headers where glibc does something truly, truly scary. Um, and likewise, we have modules enabled for about 10% of the header files in Google's code base. We picked those 10% based on the places where we thought we'd get the, the biggest impact, but it turns out that while we were deploying it, the places where you get the biggest impact have shifted a little bit as we've had other efforts to reduce the, uh, the compile time of, of those bits. And uh, we get a speed up of 10 to 50% from uh, compiling the average source file in Google from this. And again, we needed to make a number of, of bug fixes to make this work. Uh, so if you want to know more about that, I suggest you go to Manuel's talk, which is this morning. <laughs> um, and if, if you have problems with that, then I'm sure it'll be up on, on YouTube. So actually, how many people did go to Manuel's talk? That is most people, I would say. Cool. Okay, so time to get some of the skeletons out of the closet. Does it really work? Well, I mean, we had to do some fairly heroic things in the implementation because we were um, extending a compiler, which while it was designed with this sort of thing in mind from the start, there, there are a lot of um, 
interesting things that happen when you add modules to a compiler, especially the way, we, the way that we chose to do it. So Clang's approach is extremely lazy. We say we're not going to load anything from the PCM file that we don't need. There's quite a lot of places in Clang where uh, we hit something where we're like, okay, now we really do need to know what all the declarations of this thing are or what this name lookup result is. And until we hit those points, we don't load anything from the file. But there's things that can go wrong. One thing that can go wrong is sometimes we import the same entity from two different AST files. So maybe we have the inline, an inline function which was textually included into two places, we import them both, we now need to smash them together somehow. We now need to pretend that we only saw one of those. And this is, it's a little bit tricky for us to do this architecturally um, because we need to maintain all of the Clang AST invariants while we're doing this. The goal of the implementation is that no part of Clang other than the serialization layer knows anything about modules. And we pretty much succeed at that task. Uh, we can basically just say, we see, two thing, we see something, we look up something with that name that already exists, and merge it together if, it, if it's already there. But there are problems with that, like some things don't have names. So <laughs> merging together the type that is returned by this function is a bit of a pain. And this sort of thing does happen. Um, and you know we, we work through those issues, and then there's other kinds of issues we hit into. This might seem like the same thing, but this is actually quite different. So this is the case where someone gives you an AST file as an input, and you've not seen the hash include for it yet, but you know it exists. And maybe you've decided, like we do, that, uh, that you're going to look for things in that AST file because it's actually useful to do so. And one of the reasons why it's useful is that you can diagnose certain ODR violations even if they happen in code that you didn't include. That's pretty cool. Uh, but it does mean we end up in situations where we have a definition that's not visible, and then maybe we hit another definition. Because the first definition isn't visible, that's not a violation of the ODR. We don't have two definitions visible at once. Um, so we need to deal with that. And what we say is, okay, the definition from that module file, we're gonna make that one visible. We're gonna skip the tokens so that, that you wrote down here. By the ODR, we know they're the same. And we actually have some work here to say, um, we're going to check as we, uh, as we skip those tokens that we really do think it is the same, but that's not quite uh, landed upstream yet. So there's problems with that as well, like things like this that happen all the time in C system headers. Now notice that you don't know um, what the linkage name of this type is until after you've got to the end of the type. <laughs> Ouch. And cases like this. Um, Again, you don't know what enum type you're defining until you see the first enumerator. And then maybe you look it up and you say, well, this is the first enumerator of some other type. Maybe it's the same, maybe it's not. I'll work it out. Bit painful. Okay. Um, so these are problems, but these, these are um, business as usual for a C++ implementer. Our lives are a little bit tricky. C++ is not the easiest language in the world to parse. But does it really work? Yes, it actually does. We've deployed this on large code bases, and you can genuinely maintain a code base that compiles both with and without this form of modules. Okay, cool. Problem solved. We can go home. Yes? Agreed? Everyone happy with that? Gabby, you happy with this? I don't know. You don't know. <laughs> okay. So... It's probably time that we take a step back and think about the, the goals that we're trying to achieve with modules because while the thing I just talked about is probably around the best you can do without syntax changes to C++, um, that's not actually the constraints that we're living in. Um, it's the constraints that we imposed upon ourselves when, uh, when we set out to deploy modules in Google because we want to be compatible with other compilers. We have various external reasons to, to want to live under those constraints, but they're not the real constraints. So when we say modules, what do we actually mean? So there's, there's a bunch of different features we want from modules. Uh, we want to make our, our compiles faster. We want to avoid certain problems with, with the ODR, with macros interfering with, with our, uh, our, our interface definitions. Um, we want to, uh, to control uh, the things we export from our interfaces. We want to possibly have some way of saying I'm going to uh, use something in my interface that the rest of my code gets to know exists, but your code doesn't. Um, and more than that, we want to be able to say, I have 
internal things in my interface, like maybe a namespace internal, namespace details or something, which is going to be shared amongst the things that, that are my friends. And you can also have a namespace internal or namespace details that don't conflict. That would be pretty cool. Um, and we want to have some actually nice syntax for this. And we probably also want to get rid of include guards while we're at it, because who wants include guards, right? OK, so um, the, the approach that, uh, that Clang has solves some of these problems well, some of these problems with an asterisk, which means not really, maybe-ish, and some of these it really doesn't solve at all. So we don't have input syntax. That's, that's intentional, but it's also a problem because it means we're using um, preprocessor syntax for actually something it was designed for, but not something that it's actually really a good fit for. Uh, we have uh, some amount of export control in Clang's implementation, but again, no syntax for it, um, no way to easily access it. And uh, because we try to be as true as we can be to standard C++ semantics, we have no way of avoiding name collisions for internal names. Fortunately, there is another approach. Um, so there is this thing called the C++ modules TS. Um, now, the C++ modules TS is a, a work in progress technical specification for C++, which does aim to solve the problems that I just talked about. Uh, I'm going to be using the syntax in what I'm about to talk about of the modules TS plus some syntactic tweaks from a paper P0273, um, the authors of which are, I think, all in this room. So if you want to blame people, uh, you know where to find them. <laughs> Um, I'm only going to be using the syntactic tweaks that have been through the evolution working group and largely been, um, been approved in principle. Uh, if you want to know more about the modules TS, because I, I don't have time to cover the whole thing, you should see uh, Gabby's talk from last year's CPPCon. As well as Gabby's talk. As well as Gabby's talk tomorrow, yes, thank you. Yes. Um, so, I'm going to give you a rundown of roughly how uh, the Clang style modules would translate into the modules TS. So instead of having header files, we now have what are called module interface units. These define the interface of your module, and they start with this, uh, the syntax to say module foo. This says um, this is a module interface for the module foo. Uh, unlike uh, header files, nothing is exported by default. So by default, um, you, you need to opt into exporting declarations, definitions from your module. And this is actually, I think, uh, maybe rare in, in C++ that this is probably the right default. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a first class import syntax. So someone else can say, hey, that foo thing over there, I like that. Can I have everything that it imports, please? That's for everything it exports, please. Um, there's, there's a bunch more stuff, but um, this is kind of the, the heart of the, um, the modules TS. And one other thing it gives us is it gives us a module ownership semantics. So uh, entities can be owned by a particular module. And what that means is, is a few things. Um, it means for things that are exported, um, you're only allowed to have one module be like the person who's, who that belongs to. No one else is allowed to, to be declaring their old one. Uh, they're just not allowed. For internal things, uh, they get a new form of, we're calling it linkage, but you can just think of it as it's this module's, uh, this module's declaration. It's not going to conflict with anything else. There's no way you can have them both visible at the same time. So it's fine that my module foo has an X and your module foo has an X as long as they're suitably internal. OK, so this, this seems like somewhere we want to be. If we have a code base and we've managed to uh, port it or partially port it to Clang's modules, uh, we probably want to be thinking, how do we go the next step? How do we get from there back to the, uh, the C++ standard, or at least the direction it's going? So this is where we come back to needing an incremental transition plan. Uh, and more than that, with, uh, with a significantly sized code base or with any case where you want to incrementally roll out a transition, maybe over several releases of, of some project, you need your rollout plan to be maintainable at every step along the way. So, uh, and the other thing you need to be able to deal with is um, libraries that actually can't do this transition. And there's a number of reasons why libraries would be unable to transition. Uh, one of them would be maybe they still support C++ 98 users. 
Maybe they still support C++17 users. Um, maybe you can't modify them and that they just can't be bothered to modify the, the code themselves. Um, maybe they, they just have uh, customers that are forcing them to stay in that mode. Maybe it's just not your priority right now. There are a number of reasons why you might be in that boat. So let me give you an example of, of what you might want to do. Suppose you have this foo library. You, you depend on a couple of other libraries and let's say for the sake of argument, they haven't transitioned yet. Um, it doesn't fit with their team's schedule, or they can't or won't, whatever. And maybe you have uh, customers yourself who are also not modularized yet, but you still want to deploy modules for your code. This perhaps is like the, the most important thing to, to do for, for whatever goals your, your team's trying to, to achieve. So you have these couple of hash includes. And as we observed before, other code might be depending on you re-exporting those. It's, it's a sad truth, but it does happen. But maybe even it's intentional. Maybe uh, one of these provides a base class that you're using and you actually deliberately want in includes of your header to export your base class. So your base class can be used, uh, helper functions for your base class can be used, that sort of thing. Uh, so here's how you might do this with the modules TS. Um, so that there's a, a few salient parts here that are worth, uh, worth calling out. The module foo at the top we've seen before. Um, there is a foo.h at the bottom, which I'll come back to, which is how your existing customers are going to import that module. And then in the middle, we have the thing that used to be in your header file. And you'll see we've got rid of the include guards. Hooray! So, um, we have a couple of hash includes here, which we had before. We've got this class foo, which, uh, which we had before. And this whole thing is wrapped in an export module declaration. That's actually two different things there. One of them is the export construct. What the export construct says, is the declaration after me, which in this case is a module declaration, um, it, it says that thing, everything within it that is exported. So we're exporting everything in depth one, everything in depth two, and this class foo. And the module open brace, dot, 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 close brace, um, this is something from P0273, uh, which uh, it's, it's a syntax for saying we're going to turn off the uh, module linkage rules just for this little bit of code, because this is, this is legacy, this is something where we actually uh, don't want that right now. And the reason why I want to do this here is, there's a few reasons why I want to do it, but one of them is someone else might want to forward declare class foo, and we want to allow them to do that. That should still work. Okay, so now we have this, this foo.h. Uh, foo.h is what you're going to provide to your existing users who have not switched to modules yet, so they can still uh, compile. Foo.h is going to include, import your module. But it needs to do something else, because as you remember, we have this this fundamental rule for non-modular headers that if anyone um, can see the declarations from a non-modular header, they must also see the macros. In particular, they must see the include guards. So we have to provide the include guard macros somehow. And we can try to define them ourselves, but this is almost certainly a bad idea. And uh, the reason why this isn't gonna work out well for us if we want to actually check this file in is that, uh, that it's gonna constrain the people that we import, the people that we include, to not change. If they change their set of include guards, then they're gonna break us. If they add a new include into dev2.h, and we are not also providing the uh, include guard macro from that include, then our customers get broken. This is pretty bad. Uh, there's, a, there's actually another thing which goes wrong here, which is that if anyone ever does uh, choose to transition to being a bit more modular, and they say, we're gonna use import foo instead of uh, instead of hash include foo.h, then they have a problem because now people who use them and any of these headers are again gonna run into these same multiple definition problems because they again don't have the include guards. So this uh, may not be the best way to go. Another thing you could do is you could do this. And what we've done here is we've said, we're not going to re-export um, dep1 and dep2 from our module. We actually, uh, we're gonna have those not be part of our exported interface if you want those, then we're gonna put those in the header file, and foo.h should really be including that to, uh, dot h as well here, but it wasn't room on the slide. Um, so you could do this, and this will, this will probably work. There's a couple of things that are wrong with this. Uh, one of them is we actually did want to export uh, dep1, um, so we, uh, we do want to export things that, for instance, our base classes, that, that can be sometimes important. There are some other times when you want to re-export someone's interface on purpose. And it's not the common case, but it's something you sometimes want to do. Uh, and uh, 
And the other thing is that it still suffers from this problem where uh, someone who says import foo might get the wrong stuff. But the big problem is uh, we're paying the inclusion cost for the dependencies of foo.h every time someone includes it still. We've not actually saved any compile time there. So it didn't really work. Uh, it's, it's not a completely satisfying solution for incrementally transitioning. So this leaves us in an interesting situation. We have um, somewhere we want to be. We've got this module CS we want to transition to. And we can transition some of our code, maybe not all of it, maybe not all at once. But it gives us the, uh, the syntax, the semantics that we want. The question is, how do we get there? And on the other hand, we have the system in Clang, which actually does solve the incremental transition problem. We know that can be done. We've done it. Um, it does require some code-based cleanup and uh, working through a lot of uh, pain with bugs in the compiler, but you know, we've done that so you don't have to. Um, but the end state isn't actually what we want to be, uh, where we want to be. It's not clean. It's, uh, it's still got a lot of the problems that we had before. So what do we do about this? Well, I mean, actually, why don't we have both? Well, do we really want both? Something like that. Um, what, what perhaps we want, um, the idea that we had, is suppose there's some way to get the semantics of the Clang approach with the modules TS syntax. Just some small tweaks that we can make um, that would allow you to opt into getting the, the transition semantics. If we have that, if, they, if we have some way of rewriting um, the Clang modules approach using the modules TS syntax, then we're done. We, we can do all the remaining steps incrementally. We can get all the way there. We can be very happy. OK, so what are we actually missing from the modules TS to support this? Maybe you might think we're missing the implicit translation of hash includes into module imports. Maybe, but actually we can write that ourselves. That's not such a big deal. We can write header files which just say import something. Um, maybe there's some semantic tweaks that we made that are necessary to make it work. There might be a couple of those, but actually um, when we've sat down and thought really hard about those, most of them are working around, for instance, bugs in the standard library implementation that we can fix. Um, and when it comes right down to it, there's really only one thing that, uh, that we're missing. One, one thing that we can't do with the modules TS, but that is necessary for a smooth transition. And it's macros. <laughs> so after a bunch of soul searching, um, this is what we came up with. Some explicit opt-in mechanism to say, I'm sorry, guys, but uh, I want to enable legacy mode for this, this module. Uh, I want some, some, some way of saying, turn on um, the ability to store the macros from uh, a modular header, including the ones from, from all its non-modular includes, present them as part of the module interface. So this, uh, the idea is that this preprocessor directive says, all the macros defined by this module that you're currently processing they're all exported. But once we have that, um, something really nice happens. The, the Clang style modules, which as we've seen, enable a smooth transition, uh, can now be textually rewritten as uh, modules TS uh, syntax. So when you, when you see a hash include of foo.h, you don't include the real foo.h on, on disk, you include this fake foo.h, which imports the module. And the module takes the contents of the real foo.h, it wraps it in this export macro syntax we saw, adds the export, sorry, adds it, wraps in the export module syntax we saw before, adds the export macros, and then gives you the same semantics that you, uh, that you wanted. And you, you have a choice here. You could do something like Clang does, where you have module maps, and this is done semi-automatically. Or, and this is the better part, you can actually do this translation yourself um, to the files that are on disk. You can check in the result, and you can transition that way. OK, so when we have this, um, we, uh, we, we would rewrite our code like this. The difference between this and what we had before is we're using this new export macros feature. And, and now, once we transition to this, our code still works, and we can start to clean it up. We can move the, uh, the dependencies that we have that are, uh, are not supposed to be re-exported out of our export block when we've cleaned up our users. We can move 
our, uh, our class foo out of the turn off the module uh, uh, linkage semantics block when, again, when our, our dependencies no longer rely on that. We can completely delete the header file when it's no longer used, when we replace all the uses with import statements, which you know, we ought to be able to do within minutes or hours because, I mean, this is just a, a very simple uh, code transformation. And finally, we can get rid of this export macros directive when we're no longer relying on it, when we're no longer textually, uh, well, sorry, when we're no longer re-exporting the interface of any non-modular uh, headers. Okay, cool. So we've solved the problem. We can now transition. Great. There's just one more thing. So we, we do still have all of those, uh, those libraries, maybe third-party libraries, maybe our own libraries that we don't want to transition yet for whatever reason. Maybe we have open source releases and don't have to compile as C++ 98 or with L compilers, whatever. Uh, we, we do need to deal with those somehow. And with this approach, we are still cluttering up our otherwise beautiful module interfaces with hash includes, textual inclusions of the interfaces of other libraries. You probably don't like that, probably don't want that. And whenever we, uh, we rebuild our module interface, uh, we're still going to be paying compile time to reparse these, uh, these other libraries, these other headers. And we don't want that either. We, we would like that when we change our module interface, if suppose we're just doing some local testing, we've got our library, our tests, we change our, our library uh, a header, we just want to recompile our own code. Nothing else should be recompiled at all. And we still need this horrible export macros directive, which, um, which we would like to get rid of. We, we would like to transition away from that eventually. Okay, so what do we do about this? So we, we could try to fix the problem for this, this third party library. One way we can do that is we can wrap a, a module around their header for them. We can say, we know your header is modular, so we're gonna build a module for you. You're welcome. Um, and and this, this actually uh, should work um, at first, and then multiple people are gonna do the same thing. Now you'll notice I, I was quite disciplined here, and uh, I put like my beautiful library.qobject up there, and maybe other people won't be so disciplined, maybe someone will call theirs, I don't know, Q object, someone else will call theirs Q object. You'll get a collision. Won't be pretty, uh, very pretty. It won't do what you want. Um, another thing that's going to be less than desirable here is you get a certain amount of duplication of compilation effort. So once two or more people start doing this, you're going to be paying to compile this, uh, this same code over and over again, once for each person who does this sort of thing. So we, we have one last tweak that, that we're considering. Um, this final tweak um, is built on the export macros directive. And uh, what you do is you say import legacy some file. And the compiler synthesizes a module uh, interface file for you, wraps it in the appropriate uh, stuff, and gives it a name which is unique to that file. So that every time anyone does this, they get the same module. And this means we now have uh, quite a, a simple, um, almost beautiful um, interface for, for our library. We, we have just C++ source code in here. Um, the only um, exciting thing that happens is we do have a macro here, and this is part of the, the cute library, this, this key object macro. Uh, it's intentional we have that. We meant to import it. We get it, we use it, and uh, everything works. Okay, uh, and using technique like this, we, we think you can take um, large code bases, uh, you can incrementally transition them piece by piece to the modules TS. You can remove the pieces you're not, you're not using when you don't need them anymore. You don't have to wait for your dependencies to transition to modules before you can. Um, you get to go at your own pace, do the pieces that you want in the, the order that you want to do them in and not have any friction because um, things uh, change semantics in ways you didn't like. Okay. So there are a couple of principles behind all this. Um, the first one is that we really do want to support an incremental transition. Um, we really do want to allow you to go piece by piece, step by step, stopping whenever you like. And the second one is this really fundamental principle of C++ that you don't pay for what you don't use. So if you don't need uh, the export macros directive, don't use it, that's fine. Um, and if you do, it's there for you. 
Okay, so um, there, there is a proposal for the, the two new uh, features that we discussed at the end here on the way to the C++ committee um, in a couple of months' time. And we will see how well that's, that's received, whether they want to go in a different direction or whether they think this is actually a, a useful feature. Um, regardless of that, we're going to try implementing these things in Clang just to make sure that our ideas do actually work. Um, and speaking of implementations, there are uh, two compilers that do implement, um, as I understand it, production quality uh, modules at the moment. MSVC implements the current draft of the modules TS. Uh, Clang has a partial implementation of the current draft of the modules TS, and that's um, slightly modified by the, the changes that I talked about from P0273, and it's going to have um, the, the features that I talked about here in it pretty soon as well. Uh, that implementation is work in progress, but, um, but substantially complete. It's complete enough that you can, you can build code with it. And as I mentioned earlier, Clang has, for a couple of releases, uh, had an implementation of what I'm calling C++ 98 modules, which is, um, which is using the existing hash include syntax to give you module semantics. All right, any questions? It seems to me that um, import legacy would have similar problems as uh, pragma once, as uh, to determine whether a file is unique or not. Um, so the the comment was import legacy might have similar problems to pragma once, and this is about determining whether it's the same file. Uh, yes, that, that that's true. Um, so in principle, pragma once has various different problems, um, particularly on file systems which deduplicate files in cases where you have symlinks. Um, in practice, implementations have reasonable solutions to those problems these days. Uh, they may not be perfect, but uh, in most cases, you can get the right thing to happen with, with Fragment once, and likewise, the, the right thing would happen with Import Legacy. Uh, have you thought about you know, not adding another keyword legacy to the language and using perhaps static for this purpose? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah, static. We don't have enough meanings of static yet. That's a good point. <laughs> um, so actually, um, one of the things which um, P0273 introduces um, for the implementation of a module, we have, instead of just saying module foo at the start, we now say module implementation foo. And there's, there's a few other things like that. And the way those are handled is as context-sensitive keywords. So um, if you have an identifier immediately after a module, we can recognize that as being a special type of keyword which is not otherwise reserved, and that's what we're proposing to do for import legacy. Uh, legacy is not actually a keyword, it's a context-sensitive keyword. You got registers in mind. <laughs> Thanks, Marshall. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we do technically have registers sitting around. That sounds like exactly the right keyword. We could use that. Okay. Uh, we make pretty heavy uses of uh, PCH files and link time optimizations. How do modules interact with those? Or would that be something we'd be able to check incrementally, or is it an all or nothing approach? Uh, in, in Clang's implementation of modules, we allow arbitrary combinations of PCH files and modules. So um, you can have, uh, even, you, we even support, even though it's, it's kind of hard to get into this situation, we support um, building a module interface itself by starting by importing a PCH file. It's, it's very flexible in, in what we allow. Um, and sorry, what was the second part of your question? Oh, and the second part is uh, link time optimizations. Link time optimizations. Okay. Um, so the design of the module's uh, TS very much encourages that the module interface file is, uh, has separate code generation uh, than the rest of the module, uh, than people who use it. So if it has functions and variables and like defined in it, you can generate the code for those separately. And um, that's starting to work in Clang's implementation. Uh, the, the Clang modules approach um, with, with module maps and so forth doesn't do that, but it's something we're investigating as a possibility for that side as well. Um, so that's kind of part of, of the answer about what happens at link time. Um, for link time optimization, um, well, ultimately what you're looking for there is the ability to emit some kind of intermediate representation that the linker can then use to optimize code with. 
Um, one, one thing we've talked about is emitting into the PCM files that intermediate representation in addition to the Clang AST, because these, for us at least, are two separate levels of, uh, of the compilation. So we think we can get some, some gains there, perhaps, and do something which is like LTO, but a little bit more localized. Thank you. Uh, so I'm interested in finding out uh, which of my existing headers or uh, C files are, uh, are modular and which are not, and fixing it. Is there a particular set of diagnostics or a flag I should pass to Clang to make this happen? There is a tool called uh, Modularize in the, uh, the Clang distribution, which can help answer some of those questions and can help with some of the transition. Um, alternatively, you can make some fairly good headway just by building your header file as a, as a source file by itself. Just create a C++ source file that includes that header file, nothing else. If that compiles, um, then there's a good chance that at least you're not depending on uh, anyone providing anything from the outside. But there's still a few site conditions that that might trip you up. Okay. Uh, just a small comment. Uh, when I saw a legacy, the immediate thing I thought of is um, what happens when we do the next transition to the next type of modular <laughs> things and we have legacy legacy. Maybe you should use register. <laughs> I'll leave it at well, that. <laughs> it's a good stuff otherwise. Yeah. I, I, hope, uh, I hope the modules TS is forever. Cool. cool. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> So I see two opportunities for modules to be very good for the community. One of them is an optimization. The other one is an architectural building block. Um, which do you think is the more important if you could have only one? <laughs> okay, so, uh, so the question is, um, which do I think is more important, modules as an architectural building block or modules for optimization? And, um, do you mean optimization for compile time, or do you mean optimizing the, the generated code? Because we can do both to a certain extent. Okay, so what I, what I meant was a lot of the time I'm concerned that we're so eager to have modules so that we can compile faster, we mm -hmm. can get things done, that we might leave out some very important things architecturally. I see modules as the next architectural step after translation units. And while I probably can simulate the architectural stuff because that's what I do, not everybody can, so it would be very helpful if we could have something that is a real solid piece where we say we're gonna build components, uh, translation units, then we're gonna roll them up into modules and modules and translation units placed side by side. Right, um, so I, I suppose I could best summarize my thoughts on this as um, Modules for, um, for optimization, for improving build performance, that's very much a um, short term, uh, that's a tactical play in order to keep C++ viable um, for people who are having compile time pain. Modules to fundamentally improve the semantics of the C++ language, that's, that's the strategic play, that's really um, where the, the value comes from five years, 10 years down the line, that's, uh, that's I think, in some sense, much more important, but it's value that you don't get unless you have the other thing as well. Okay. I was just wondering, there was, I didn't see any examples for like, um, normally with like s s header files and CPP files, you have the declaration separated from the definition. Um, you had like a different file, like a CPPN file for the modules. How would you go about doing that? Or is, are we, with modules, where are you gonna be getting rid of the whole separation or is it? That, that, that's a really good question. Okay, so the question is with modules, do we get rid of the separation between uh, implementation files and interface files? We have this CPPM suffix file, is that, just a source file and you don't need a separate source file anymore. Um, so it can be. Um, that is certainly your option. Um, you can put a C++ source file, a, a source text in that module interface file, do everything you like in there. Um, whether that's actually a good thing is uh, a separate question. Uh, and in particular, the thing that you might want to keep in mind is how frequently that code is going to change, what it's going to depend on, and how frequently that changes. Um, because anything you put in your module interface file, if any of that changes for any reason, then anyone who's using your module also recompiles. So um, there are definitely trade-offs to be made there. And maybe we can imagine that tools will become smarter in future and we won't need to trigger those, uh, those recompiles, but 
Um, a lot of current build systems don't have the technology to say, did this change in a semantic really relevant way? Um, so one of the earlier questions about using this for architectural reasons got me thinking about uh, modules versus namespaces and how, how much similarity and difference is there there. Do modules participate in name lookup? Like when I say import foo, like what does that actually do? Do I still have to okay. using all the namespaces from it? Can I import just foo, like from foo import bar Python style, or do I get all or nothing? So right now there is no syntax to say that you only get part of the, the interface provided by a module. Uh, but module names are a completely separate namespace from namespaces. Uh, <laughs> We need more words, but anyway, um, <laughs> modules live in their own, module names live in their own space. Uh, there is no link between that and, uh, and namespaces. The two are completely orthogonal. Um, the only way in which um, modules change kind of the, the name lookup rules at all is in the sense of module ownership and module visibility. Um, so in particular, if, if a module's not visible, you can't see the things that are within it. And um, in certain cases, two modules are allowed to have non-conflicting um, definitions of the same name um, if, if they're internal to that module. So I could have like two different modules, A and B, both of which put certain things into namespace foo, um, but if I only import A, ADL will be different things than if I import A and B. Not that I would do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that could happen. Okay. <laughs> uh, fantastic. Uh, just sort of an interesting question. Can modules be nested to form hierarchies, or is that verboten? <laughs> well, that's, it's somewhat of an open question. Um, this was something that P0273 touched on. Um, so module names can have uh, periods in them. There is some notion of hierarchy, but at the moment, uh, all the period is is essentially another character that can appear in the module name. It doesn't mean anything right now. Uh, one of the things that, um, that P0273 was, uh, was looking into was, do we need some way of taking the interface of a single module and splitting it across multiple files? And if you do that by imports, then you have this module ownership constraint coming in and maybe stopping you from doing some of the, the cyclic references you want to make. Um, so, we're worried that people would turn to hash includes to solve that problem, and so we presented an alternative. Um, and so far, it looks like that's been received favorably, but you never know how things are going to go until they're voted into the working paper. Yeah, I, I guess this is kind of answered already, but um, relative address, uh, relative naming of modules seems like it might be a useful thing to have, but maybe that's still up in the air. Um, my other question is about export module as a preprocessor directive, um, is it scoped by a block in that no. syntax? It's for the rest of the file? Um, so the, there's a question of is it for the rest of the file or is it for the entire file? I think either of those is, is actually acceptable. Okay. Um, I'm not particularly tied to one or the other. The way that we have it specified currently, it says for the entire file, but it might actually be more useful to say from this point onwards or something like that. But it, it's not block scoped. We're not expecting the preprocessors to do brace matching or anything yeah, like that. Yeah, that's what I was worried about. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Okay. That's that's time. Thank you everyone. <laughs>